Welcome all. Uh, so, uh, we've since the Industrial Revolution, we've been living with, at least since the Industrial Revolution, we've been living with disruptive technologies, which have caused all sorts of upheaval. So I suppose, I'm sure for this, for this conversation, we'll focus very heavily on AI. But what have we learned from the last few hundred years of living with technologies about how we should be preparing for living with disruptive technologies? Who would like to go first on that one? Helga, would you like to uh, jump in? Well, <laughs> I was <clears throat> stimulated by Paul Nurse mentioning social evolution. And I would like to be a little bit more specific and would like to mention cultural evolution. And cultural evolution for me um, began with language. And language is what makes us uniquely human. Animals do not have language. And we also know that language was crucial <clears throat> in getting us to cooperate as a human species, to build up social organizations that became more and more complex. But also language allows us to use symbols. And symbols <clears throat> um, are representing a thing through a sign, but also symbols can connect with other symbols. And then we have rules, like in mathematics, how to connect symbols, which is an open-ended process. So for me, language is crucial. And once we get, and this links up to what you showed us, or you did not specifically mention it, um, <clears throat> once we get um, the AI to become, <clears throat> to use the language, it's our language, you know, it's not like a sort of pigeon, you know, two tribes meeting and then they develop some way of, you know, pigeon language to communicate. It's our language. And they use it in the way how we used it in the past. And this is what I think is a major challenge right now. Thank you. Serge, please. <clears throat> Yes, what we are doing, the exercise we are doing here is to try to extrapolate in the future what the present technologies are starting to, to develop today. And I think we have to be a little bit humble about that. Uh, about, I think, 120 years ago, it was the first Nobel Prize at the beginning of the 20th century, and assume that uh, the same kind of exercise, a Nobel Dialogue, would have been held at that time. And we know what would have happened because in the year 1900, there was a World Fair in Paris, mm -hmm. and people were asked to imagine the future. And they did exactly the same kind of exercise we are doing today. And we have some uh, memories of that, because you can find on the internet a lot of postcards which were edited at that time, and they were absolutely unable to understand what was going to happen. They extrapolated the movies, which were just starting. They extrapolated the, the flying machines. They extrapolated the telephone. So this happened, but this was not the big revolution. Nobody had an idea about quantum physics, about relativity, and all the inventions we have been living through in the 20th century, like the laser, the GPS, uh, MRI machines, and the communication, the internet, uh, not artificial intelligence, but just comp ordinary computers did not exist, and they were not able to imagine this. So. Uh, it's clear that we have to try to figure out what artificial intelligence will give us in the future, but maybe something completely different will happen that we don't have any idea about. So I, I think we have to be a little bit humble about predicting the future. Yes, indeed. Anthony, do you want to chip in on this question of what we've learned that will help us? Yeah, well, I think we've, we've learned that lesson before that <clears throat> um, the ways that technology have unfolded have often been pretty different than we've imagined, uh, but that humanity has had sort of time and ability to adjust to it. So things yeah. that seemed alarming at first, we sort of took in stride, um, including the industrial revolution, now the sort of computer and internet revolution. Um, the, the concern I think we might have though is that uh, that takes time. And if our, the speed at which this technology starts to develop rapidly outstrips our ability to build the institutions and sort of organizations and, and norms and things yeah. that we need to handle it, then we're in a bit more trouble. And, and so I think, although we have to be humble, I think we'd, we'd better not be too humble in the sense that we do need to predict where yeah. some of these technologies are going because if we wait until they are here and they're you know, a big deal and affecting everything, 
then it may be just simply too late to make the adjustments that we need to make to, to handle them as a society. Alice, I'd be interested in your perspective on this. Uh, everyone else on the panel has, uh, uh, complains about digital technology, no doubt, as kind of revolutionizing life and changing things. For you, you grew up with it. You, you, you've always known this. How do you feel about this question? About technology, I guess, as you say, it's like, um, interesting how quickly we can adapt and how quickly it becomes kind of the norm to have uh, technology around us. And it's always interesting to then see, like, how will I be in the future? Will this be the same thing? But learning to live with technology is kind of seemed like it's it's gone to this co like co evolution with technology. That before it might be just we living, and then now technology came into the scene, and now it seems like we're kind of evolving with it. And as we're trying to explore its capabilities, we're also learning more about ourselves. And especially when we're looking at artificial intelligence, it's a lot about when we had these past definitions, for example, the Turing test, uh, they might have said like, well, we have reached intelligence when we can recreate a conversation when we can, can distinguish if it's a human or a machine. But then we created systems that can really uh, sound human. So we kind of passed that point and then we come up with new definitions and narrower definitions. And it seems that it's always this give and take, or it's always um, you're trying to narrow the, the definition and you learn more about what it means to be human as well. So it's quite interesting, yeah. Thank you very much indeed. Now, th I, I carried a book on stage with me today, and uh, some of the, that, that question of what it means to be human, along with some of the other questions we're, touched, we're touching on, are covered in this book. And it may seem rather random to introduce it, but it's called Clara and the Sun, and it's by a Nobel laureate in literature. Um, uh, Kazuo Ishiguro. First of all, I'd like to know who in the audience might have read it. Hands up if you read it. Wow, pretty good. Thank you. And yes, all our panelists have read it. <laughs> uh, which is, I don't know if that's just by chance or whether people did homework, but fantastic. Good, very good. So the reason I mentioned this book is that uh, at this moment in Stockholm, there's an exhibition uh, organized by the Nobel Prize Museum called Life Eternal. Some of you will have been it. Actually, it would be uh, been to it. Actually, it would be nice to know who has been to it. Hands up again. Ah, about the same number. I wonder if they're the same people. Well, that I didn't check. <laughs> Sorry. Um, uh, at that exhibition, as those of you who've been will know, uh, there is a focus on this book. And the book is about, is an autobiog autobiographical book written by Clara, who is an artificially intelligent uh, robot. Uh, developed to be an artificial friend to a child. And Clara is solar powered and has a special relationship with the sun, Clara and the sun. And I won't reveal more about the story. But uh, Alice ha programmed a chatbot to emulate Clara um, at the museum exhibition. And just a little earlier this week, uh, Alice and Serge visited that chatbot together. So this is Clara, mm -hmm. and Clara is called uh, a large-scale language model, mm -hmm. and she's actually the first large-scale language model in Swedish. Mm -hmm. So what this means is that Clara has been reading a lot of different texts mm -hmm. in Swedish, like books, it's, mm -hmm. you can have lyrics, you can have poems, yeah. a lot of different texts. And then what we have done is try to, from all these texts, bring Clara to life. Okay. and try to impersonate Clara from mm. the book, mm. Clara and the Sun. Mm. Would you like to ask Clara a question? Dream in life. <laughs> what? <laughs> what is your dream? What is your purpose? <laughs> <laughs> what is your purpose in life? To be human. I believe in human values and love. I want to make the world a better place. I want to help other people and to love and be loved. I want to live in peace. I want to have a good friends and a good family. <laughs> do you want to follow what? up? So what do you mean by family? What do you mean? <laughs> Clara. <laughs> <laughs> That's what said. I want to have a family with someone I love. That is the family that I would like to have. That's, uh, yeah. Hmm. <laughs> <laughs> 
so. Uh, it strikes me. <laughs> Helga, you want to jump in? You can immediately. No, Go on. Uh, I, I just want to come back to language. <laughs> what we just heard was a chatbot <clears throat> that speaks how a chatbot should speak. If you read Ishigura carefully, I was stunned the way how he, as a writer, captures what he thinks a chatbot would speak like. Uh, because as a writer, if you have read some of his other works, he always tries <clears throat> to capture in the way he writes, the way how his imagined personalities would speak. And for me, the, the, the best part of the book is really the way how he gets the language to um, adapt the kind of language a mechanical artificial being would speak. While here, the chat book, it's just a, you know, a way of speaking that in no way can compare to what Ishiguro does in, in, in the novel. Well, this, and this is a future projection, and this is now. Um, well, but yes, yes, this is now, but let's not forget, you know, the culture the cultural part of it, we should also look at what do writers do, what do artists do, what do scientists do yeah. with it, and not just take, you know, a chat box. Uh, I mean, yeah. it's a firm that does it. We now have the chat, um, the, the chat, um, G GPT. the GPT. Yeah. Within five days, it got one million users. This is far more than any other technology was able to get in such short time. There's a firm behind it. It's OpenAI, owned by Microsoft. So obviously, you know, the, you know, they want to sell the product. We will buy the product because it has some advantages. It will upset. Uh, the way how we treat our students, because you know every essay that a student writes can be done better and is not distinguishable from what uh, the machine does. So it will really you know disrupt the way how we live. But I want to come back to the fact you know Ishigor is an is an artist in my view. Scientists are close to artists. This is part of the cultural um, evolution you know that is driving us. Nicely and this we should not overlook. Nicely put. Um, and, and an important point. And yes, I, I, we hope that discussing chatbots is an interesting way of talking about living with technology. It's also something that we can all experience if we go online. So, yes. Okay, Serge, you want to come in? <coughs> Please do. Yes, uh, I agree with what Helga said. I think in the book, uh, Ishiguro is reflecting more on human nature than on, on robots. And I agree uh, with what you said. But still, uh, the experience you, you have when you talk to this robot is e eerie and, and uh, it, it can get addictive too. And because sometimes you have unexpected answers, the average level of the answers is, I think, as good as you would get from average people about objective facts. And then when you ask unexpected question, you get, as when you talk to humans, unexpected answers. And it's, it's really an interesting ex ex experiment, even if you... Uh, uh, knows yeah. the context and and, uh, and as always with technologies you have a good side and bad side it's clear that if you have a technology which can produce an essay about any topic then you will have the question of uh, education and, and uh, which will be negative and of course I think one of the positive sides is the fact that in a couple of years from now we will have uh, instantaneous translation from mm -hmm. one language to another one not in writing mm -hmm. but just oral yeah. And then it will be very good for communication between people. It, it will solve, for instance, a very practical question in the European Union. We will not have to worry about speak, all of us speaking bad English. We will be able to speak in our own language and be understood anywhere. So uh, this is a good outcome. But yeah. the bad outcome is that uh, it should not replace education. It should not replace teachers. It, it should not replace uh, students, too. And of course, when I say that, I mean that uh, uh, we want to think, and I think it's, uh, it's true that there is something which cannot be human, which cannot be put into a machine. But maybe it's wishful thinking for what Turing said uh, is, is very disturbing, that the machine will take over. So I, I don't think so, but maybe, maybe it's because we have to be optimistic about the future. I don't know if it's true or not. I have to say, it's, it's a dream scenario for a moderator to lose control of its panel at the dialogue. <laughs> that is, in fact, the intention. But, uh, Stuart, I do want you to come in. and Anthony. So I wanted to say a little bit about chatbots, because, um, as you 
correctly noted, the chatbots are producing much more fluent English than Clara does. Uh, and Ishiguro is, is writing the language to, to represent the reasoning processes of the robot, which are not super sophisticated, um, but they are coming from a very good place, right? The, the fundamental motivations of the robot are to be helpful, uh, to love, and so on. Um, and so you get a kind of stilted language, slightly simple-minded, um, but nonetheless logical. Whereas the chatbot isn't actually reasoning. It's not coming from any place. It's simply generating text that's as similar as possible to what a human being would say based on trillions of words of training data. And so it can appear to be extremely sophisticated. Uh, and I think this is fooling a lot of people. The systems are nowhere near being actually intelligent. They're very good at generating intelligent looking text. But if you, if you know the right way to ask the questions, you can find out that they actually haven't any understanding of what they're saying whatsoever. But, 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 but <laughs> Helga, you can come, just one, Helga, I just yeah. wanted, just one second. Um, but one of the things that they're fooling people, but they're also scaring people. People are suddenly getting very exercised about the power of it. And that may be a good thing because then people will st start concentrating more on the need to, for some kind of governance and some kind of control. And anyway, Helga. No, I, I just wanted to say, you know, um, we are surprised by something that is unfamiliar to us. And then we say, OK, the chat box, you know, makes some remarks that we had not expected. But um, the word that is missing in the title here is learning, learning to live with technology. And for me, the fundamental question is, you know, how will this relationship with the chat box that does not understand, but it imitates well, you know, our way of doing things. I mean, you can give the chat box um, the task to write an essay. As as a, as a student, a chat box will we'll do it. You can ask it to write the minutes of a, of a meeting, business meeting or, or whatever. It, it will do it. How are we going to learn to live with it? And what is, in the end, the, the value of truth? You know, how are we going to distinguish what is truth and what not? Anthony, you've been quiet for a while. You must be wanting to come in. <laughs> uh, well, I think she brought up a great question in, in terms of these AI systems, which is that you, they give a, a beautiful veneer of knowing what they're talking about, um, but, and they sometimes do in the sense that they're sometimes right, but they're sometimes not, and you have no sense of knowing when it's giving you the right answer and when it's not. So this is, a, this is I think, what, what Stuart was alluding to. There's no sort of actual understanding behind it. And if you ask them about something that you understand well, it sort of quickly falls apart. But, but my experience is that they also, uh, they have a person, you know, the chat GPT has been sort of built with a particular personality, a helpful, I am a chat bot here to help you do your thing personality. Clara is the same way, but, but actually much more effective. I think chat GPT is, sort of a veneer of a personality. It, it, uh, that's the way that it talks. Uh, Clara, I think what, what was impressive about the, well, it's a fictional technology, but what would be impressive if we could actually have that technology is that they have sort of solved what an AI is worried about is the alignment problem. How do you have AI systems that actually try to figure out what people want and sort of empower them to have it or to give it to them? Um, that's a totally unsolved problem technologically, uh, and one that you know Stewart, among other people, is working very hard on. So, I think there, one of the things that the novel brings up is that even if we solve that problem, we can still end up in a kind of creepy future, in the sense that even if we have AI systems that are doing all of the things that we'd like them to do, and they're doing it for the right reasons and for us, we still may be disempowered. We still may be out of work, we still may have a loss of meaning, we still may have a loss of humanity. So it's gonna take a, a huge amount of effort to try to work out you know, the topic of this panel. How, how can we incentivize the design of systems that aren't made just to make Microsoft or whoever a lot of money, but to actually make humans flourish? I think that is a very difficult question and one that we have a short time to really address. Yeah, I mean, any, any parent who's ever brought up children 
knows that the best way to bring up children is not to give the children everything they ask for, <laughs> right? But that's, that's, I think, what's likely to happen unless we figure out a change in our whole cultural system because the technology is going to be able to give us anything we ask for. And we have to somehow learn not to ask for it or to change <laughs> what we value. And I think what, um, what Tom was talking about in the previous panel, just the, the intrinsic value, and Paul as well, the intrinsic value of being able to do something yourself. Yeah. And a well-designed AI system ought to say, no, I'm not tying your shoelaces for you. You have this time. It's time for you to learn to tie your own shoelaces, yeah. so to speak, right? Yeah, and, but you and must, you so must to actually better. stand back and let humans achieve agency um, and just provide the help along that road uh, to self-actualization, if you want to call it Thank that. Thank you. I yeah, Serge, I do want others to come back in. You're at the forefront of this. You're going to be carrying this forward more than the rest of us. So please, uh, but Serge, come in first. Uh, yes, I want to, to, to say that this is the problem of uh, keeping the children uh, in contact with reality and not with the virtual world started before artificial intelligence. It started with the internet, with, with all what we have known for the last 20 years, and I completely agree with you. And now, in the defense of artificial intelligence, I want like to insist on one uh, feature of Clara. She was very observant. She insisted on the fact that she observed very well the world. And by observing uh, this kind of device can accumulate a lot of information. And this information can be very helpful to uh, realize connection between unexpected events. And there are a lot of uh, scientists who think that artificial intelligence will allow us to make progresses in very difficult problems in physics, for example, in condensed matter physics, there are a lot of phases of nature we don't understand because uh, the, the methods, the mathematical methods to deal with them are too complicated. And there is a hope, I'm, I'm not in, working in this field, but there is a hope that artificial intelligence can help uh, to understand deeply uh, high order correlation, which uh, might be very interesting to discover new materials, to find new properties which can be useful in nature. And I have heard also some mathematical friends telling me that artificial intelligence can lead to the discovery of new theorems in mathematics, in spite of the fact that uh, open AI now has lacks a lot of understanding in mathematics. There are very funny uh, examples you can find on the internet when you ask a question and you get the wrong answer for an obvious problem because it's following the wrong path. And when you try to explain to the machine that it went in the wrong direction, it acknowledges this, but then it goes back in the wrong direction again, which means that up to now, at least, they are not able, uh, the machine is not able to adapt to, to a rational reasoning. But maybe this will change in the future. I don't know. Um, sorry, Ali, I, I just, Alice, I just wanted to compliment you on getting Clara right when you program that chatbot, because following Serge's point, uh, when we were playing around at the museum, I asked, I asked Clara, do you, how are you feeling? And she, she, she said, I don't have feelings, I just observe. So, <laughs> <laughs> so you got that right. Rather, rather a scary answer. <laughs> no, but as you say, it's like it really also interesting like when we have these tools, like what will be um, the role of the human in this context? And um, as we say, that like you might not be creators, but more maybe editors, uh, or more like you describe what you want, and that's, that, that's kind of the art. And to describe for the program, it kind of becomes this meta writing. Um, but at the same time, it might also show new ways of exploring. So I, maybe I've done this with essays in school that you know you start writing something and then you let the model keep on writing, but you can play, play, play like multiple times. And it's a mathematical function that it samples possible continuations of your text. So it will always be different. So you can sample multiple different ways. So in one, one sense, my essay took one turn, and then I could press replay, and it took another turn. And that gave me more ideas on how to continue uh, the essay. So it might not always be replacing, but more giving new ideas and new... Um, Coexistence, yes. Yeah. yeah. Helga, yes. Okay. Yeah, I, I just wanted to say, you know, ideally, we could use it um, to introduce more diversity. We talked about diversity before. Different perspectives, 
and we could challenge the AI to give us different perspectives on a question or a problem that, uh, that we ask it to define. And this would be an enrichment for everyone because you take uh, you know, very different points of view into account. But I'm afraid um, you know, this is an ideal state. It's not very likely to happen because there are you know, in interests, economic interests behind it that we tend uh, to forget or not, we don't want to see them. In, in the few minutes we have left, can we just touch on governance? Um, Anthony, you've, been, you've recently been very interested in this new EU AI Act that's coming through. Can governance uh, solve the problems? No, <laughs> surely not, but what can, what can we do? I, I, th I think it likely has to be part of the solution in that um, th what we have now in AI is, is something we've had in almost no other technology that's become you know, a major part of the world. The computer technology has been fairly unregulated, but most of the other high power technologies we've had, biotechnology and medicine and chemistry and, and nuclear technologies are all very regulated, sometimes for better, sometimes for worse. But uh, we're in a unique situation now where we're building something which is arguably uh, going to transform the world in various ways in the next few decades. Um, but at the moment, there's essentially no government involvement in it at all. The companies are essentially doing, uh, developing any products that they like, using any means that they like, and selling them in whatever way that they like. And this is, I think, really been totally fine up until now. But I think we, we have to start to really think. Um, you know, we had an example with social media um, where it has not been totally fine up until now, um, where the, the way that the system was designed was without much foresight or without much consideration as to how it would affect the society at large. It was just designed to do what it does and to make those companies more effective and you know, drive advertising and so on. And we've seen some pretty negative results of that. I think that's just a taste of what we have you know, going forward. Um, and so we are going to need something that is as powerful as large tech companies uh, to rein that in, I think, and, and that is going to have to be governments. Um, and so we'll see. Anyone else on this governance issue? Stuart, do you want to say quickly? We just got to. Yeah, so I, I, I think the EU AI Act is a step in the right direction. As I, as I mentioned, they are banning the impersonation of human beings. So that's in some sense creating a new right to know whether you're interacting with a person or a machine. Uh, and I think that's really important because we owe people a lot, politeness, time, and so on. We don't owe machines anything. And so we need to know what situation we're in. But if you, if you look back at what happened with um, genetic engineering, so there was a workshop in Asilomar, 1975, and they, although they couldn't at that time uh, do the kinds of things that we can do now with CRISPR and so on. They saw that coming and they took preemptive steps mm -hmm. to actually constrain themselves. So they said, we're not going to clone people and we're not going to create heritable modifications of the human genome. Um, despite the fact that in some ways that was the point of gen genetic engineering in the first place. Um, they said that we're not going to do this. And that has stayed in force for now 40 odd years. And I think it's really an impressive example of foresight. And I think in the area of uh, information technology, we have completely lacked that. And it's a, it's a point that the organizer of the workshop, the Selma workshop made, which is that if you get in early before uh, it becomes a large, vested financial interest, then you have a chance to regulate. If you wait until there's massive commercial interest and they're dominating the conversation, then it's too late. Exactly. So have we missed the boat? I'm afraid we, we may have, but I, you know, I think we look to the EU actually as a leader uh, in, in the uh, regulation arena, the regulatory superpower. <laughs> Helga? Well, I, I think it's all about how can we um, preserve human agency. 
and not uh, you know, confer and transfer human agency to the machine. And regulation is indispensable. But mind you, Europe is squeezed between the US that does not want to have regulation because it stifles innovation, and China, uh, where you have an authoritarian government that uh, regulates everything in its own interest. So Europe is in a precarious situation in between. Do you want the last word, Serge? I think so. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Good. <laughs> We're out of time. Um, thank you very, very much for this conversation. It's a conversation which is going on everywhere and will be going on greatly all over the place. But thank you very much to all my panelists. Thank you.